Okay, I, I want to bring the third speaker on stage, uh, Javier Garcia Martinez, a Spanish, Spanish researcher, uh, entrepreneur, scientist. Where is my clicker? Since I'm from Spain, I think I'm going to speak in Spanish, if you don't mind. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, Llegué a MIT apenas unos días después de los atentados del 11 de septiembre. Hacía muy poco que el gobierno americano había puesto más de 3.000 millones de dólares en la primera iniciativa nacional para apoyar la nanotecnología. Hoy, 13 años más tarde, el 15% de los productos manufacturados ya incluyen la nanotecnología. La Iniciativa Nacional por la Nanotecnología, que inició el presidente Clinton y finalmente eh, apoyó y financió el presidente Bush, supuso el primer espaldarazo para lo que se ha convertido en una, una, una verdadera revolución tecnológica. La nanotecnología es hoy en día ya una realidad que nos está impactando en todos los sectores, desde la salud hasta los materiales, y los textiles. De hecho, la Comunidad Valenciana, por su tejido empresarial y sus áreas prioritarias, es una de las comunidades autónomas que mejor se podrían beneficiar de esta tecnología. Pero cuando llegué a MIT, decidí primero aprender y luego aplicar estos primeros avances en nanotecnología en un campo que se ha demostrado ser uno de los más importantes y que, en mi opinión, va a definir el siglo 21, y es el de la energía. Vamos a doblar la demanda energética en los próximos 20, 25 años y no tanto por el aumento de población, sino sobre todo por la demanda per cápita, porque se está incorporando a la economía productiva cientos de miles de personas, sobre todo en las economías emergentes. La nanotecnología está impactando prácticamente todas las tecnologías del sector eh, energético. Sol, eh, células solares, células de combustible, gas natural, refino de petróleo, hidrógeno, metanol, prácticamente cualquier tecnología que podemos pensar, la nanotecnología está jugando un papel fundamental. ¿Cuál será la tecnología que va a definir el futuro del sector energético en el futuro, en los próximos años? Seguramente todas ellas. Y todas ellas están beneficiando de los avances en nanotecnología, del grafeno, de los fulerenos, de los nanotubos de carbono, de nanopartículas, materiales que son y que hacen más eficientes los procesos energéticos. Pero si estamos hablando del sector energético, el elefante en la habitación sería el gas natural. Hoy en día la explosión de la cantidad de gas natural que disponemos fundamentalmente en Estados Unidos, con, eh, veis claramente en, en esta gráfica como el shale gas, el, el gas que viene de la, del fracking, supone, suponía hasta hace unos pocos años apenas un porcentaje muy pequeño de, de la tarta energética de Estados Unidos y en pocos años va a suponer hasta el 50%. Este cambio es tan profundo que Estados Unidos, todos lo conocemos bien, es un gran importador de hidrocarburos, se va a convertir en unos pocos años, seguramente en el año 2020, en un exportador nato de hidrocarburos. No hace falta pensar mucho para saber cómo esto va a redefinir la geopolítica del mundo. En los próximos años vamos a tener también que lidiar con otros hidrocarburos, el shale, el shale um, oil, tight oil y también las uh, tierras bituminosas eh, que son muy, muy abundantes. Pero no podemos seguir utilizando estos recursos escasos y contaminantes sin aplicar los avances en nanotecnología que nos van a permitir hacer un uso, primero, más eficiente y racional y, segundo, minimizar el impacto sobre el medio ambiente de estas tecnologías. Los catalizadores, los procesos eh, químicos actuales que se utilizan para el procesado de gas natural o para el refino de petróleo no están optimizados, todavía no están adaptando los últimos avances en nanotecnología. ¿Cuál es mi visión? Mi visión es transformar las refinerías, las grandes factorías del siglo XX, en nuevas factorías de producción de energía gracias a, a procesos de nanotecnología. Voy a explicar ahora muy brevemente en qué consiste la tecnología que desarrollé en MIT 
que licencié y que finalmente dio lugar a Drive Technology, que es la empresa de la que soy fundador. Como decía anteriormente, los catalizadores que se utilizan hoy en día para el refino de crudo eh, no están modificados con eh, herramientas de nanotecnología, tienen estas estructuras eh, con poros, con cavidades, que se repiten en el espacio, porque en realidad son estructuras cristalinas, de forma que los hidrocarburos son capaces de entrar dentro de la porosidad de estos catalizadores y lo que hacen estos catalizadores es romper estas moléculas, porque los hidrocarburos que están en el crudo son moléculas muy grandes, muy voluminosas y lo que queremos son eh, gasolina y diésel, moléculas mucho más pequeñas. ¿Cuál es el problema? El problema es que los catalizadores actuales tienen unos poros muy pequeños que no permiten el acceso de hidrocarburos más grandes y cada vez hay más necesidad de procesar crudos más pesados, crudos más difíciles de procesar. De forma que estas fracciones dejan el catalizador sin ser transformadas. Gracias a la nanotecnología hemos podido modificar la estructura de los catalizadores actuales para incorporarles una porosidad adicional, una porosidad más abierta, que ahora sí hace accesible estos catalizadores a los hidrocarburos incluso más pesados. De forma que ahora estos hidrocarburos, que ahora sí pueden entrar al interior de los catalizadores, encontrarán el sitio activo, el sitio catalítico, romperse y formar más gasolina, más diésel y muchísimos menos residuos o agentes contaminantes. De forma que hacemos un mejor uso, más eficiente de los recursos naturales que disponemos hoy en día. Pero esta plataforma tecno tecnológica que, que disponemos en Rive Technology no solamente se puede utilizar para la producción de gasolina y diésel, ya que en realidad la limitación que he descrito, que es los catalizadores actuales tienen poros muy pequeños, es una, es una uh, limitación general de la industria química. Entonces, prácticamente en todos los sectores de la industria química en los que haya que procesar moléculas muy voluminosas, como en biocombustibles o en química fina o en síntesis de compuestos farmacéuticos, nuestra tecnología tiene un papel que jugar. ¿Cómo hacemos dinero? En el año 2012, con un acuerdo estratégico con Grace Davison, produjimos 300 toneladas de catalizador. No es un sector que se hable en pequeñas cantidades, una gran cantidad de catalizador. Y lo introdujimos en una refinería media de Estados Unidos y fuimos introdu introduciendo nuestro catalizador día a día y observando cuál era el efecto sobre el valor económico que tenía la refinería al utilizar nuestro catalizador modificado con nanotecnología. Y lo que observamos es este incremento tan sustancial en, eh, en el rendimiento económico de la refinería. Hoy en día, Rife Technology acaba de cerrar una ronda de financiación con Aranco, la empresa petrolera de Arabia Saudí, para extendernos a Oriente Medio y con alguna empresa también europea, que todavía no puedo anunciar, para otros procesos más allá del refino de petróleo. Muchas veces me preguntan que si podría haber hecho esto en España. Y la respuesta honesta es que sí lo podría haber hecho, pero no se me hubiera ocurrido. Porque cuando yo llegué a MIT, lo que descubrí allí fue en dos cosas. Uno, algo que hoy en día llamamos ecosistema, pero que en realidad lo que significa es que es natural para gente, que tenía yo entonces unos veintipocos años, crear una empresa. Es algo de lo que se habla, es algo que viene de abajo hacia arriba, no viene impuesto. Y luego, otra cosa muy importante que encontré es método. Hay un método. Hay una forma de extraer la tecnología del laboratorio al mercado. No es que la de MIT sea la única, pero había una metodología que a mí me ayudó muchísimo a dar el paso de MIT a Rife Technology. Además, hay un ecosistema, hay muchísimas otras cosas que ocurren en Boston. Hay una muy buena universidad que hace una investigación básica muy buena y lo que hace es crear un círculo, un círculo virtuoso alrededor de ella que atrae al mejor talento porque uno quiere estar donde ocurren las cosas interesantes, las mejores escuelas de negocios, la, la propiedad intelectual y el capital riesgo. Cuando vine a España, esta fue la realidad que me encontré. Esto es cómo ha evolucionado la inversión pública en I+.D. en los últimos tres años. Y si queremos competir en tecnología, no lo podemos hacer sin invertir 
en tecnología. Podemos crear sistemas emprendedores, podemos crear programas, pero lo último que se le ocurriría al MIT es recortar su presupuesto de investigación. En el, los pocos minutos que me quedan me gustaría destacar algo fuera de la idea MIT Europa o MIT España y hablar otra vez del elefante de la habitación y en este caso es China y de la necesidad que tenemos tanto europeos como americanos de pensar de qué forma competimos en un mundo global donde China está liderando, entre otras cosas, la manufactura. Hace dos días volví de Moscú, de, del Open Innovation Forum, que organiza el gobierno ruso, y allí capté algunos mensajes que me gustaría compartir con ustedes muy brevemente. Es cómo están innovando las, las economías emergentes. Primero, están invirtiendo en I+.D. China es ya el segundo país en inversión en I+.D. Invierte 17 veces más que España. Y no es una excepción de China. Los cuatro países de los BRIC, Brasil, eh, Rusia, India y China, todos están entre los 10 primeros inversores en I+.D. Y España, por supuesto, por debajo. Cuando en el informe PISA, lo último que voy a decir, cuando en el informe PISA por primera vez se incluyeron países que no eran miembros de la OCDE, los países que, que estaban por encima eran precisamente países emergentes, como China y la India. Y como son países que todavía tienen que construir mucha, infru, eh, mucha infraestructura y que no tienen muchos recursos, lo que hacen es priorizar en algunas áreas que son importantes para su sector. Y ese es el mensaje final que quería dar sobre eh, qué podíamos hacer aquí en España. Consciente de que hoy tenemos que reducir el déficit y que no tenemos dinero público para invertir en, en I más D y en investigación básica, por lo menos lo que tendríamos que tener es método. Tendríamos que tener estrategias como país, estrategias a largo plazo que dieran seguridad para la inversión y atrajeran el mejor talento. Muchas gracias. Bueno, hay, Javier, ¿dónde lo veis? Es el, el único español que ha ganado eh, el premio de innovadores menores de 35 a escala global. Eh, el, el, año, el mismo año que ganó Mark Zuckerberg, ¿no? Estuvisteis entre los 35 mm. del mundo. Realmente interesante tu, tu eh, posición. Gracias. Uh, I have a, a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I don't know how to sum, sum them up, and maybe you want to discuss a few things among you from, from he hearing each other speak. Um, one of the questions that was particularly interesting was, How early in your research did you get in contact with market needs? Or did the institution where you, you were doing research um, you know, put you in contact with real clients or with, with the industry? I think for us it varies. Um, in the ideal case, researchers um, think about market needs from the very beginning. And there's, there's different markets. In reality, um, that's very difficult because at a place like SRI, our research is funded by clients. So everyone, um, all of the researchers at SRI are very busy satisfying their clients' needs, which is good. That's an excellent discipline to have. Sometimes those client needs align very well with the market, <coughs> meaning the large commercial market. Often they do not, which means that it's at a later stage that the needs of the commercial market are brought in and the researchers participate in that. Uh, just one comment on that. Um, Javier was talking about ecosystem and he was showing the ecosystem around Boston, which is wonderful. Um, we also have an ecosystem around us. And I will say that it's a huge advantage because Our researchers talk every day to their friends who are in startup companies and in Facebook and Google and so forth. So they absorb market needs very naturally, at least in the software industry. Yeah, um, let's, at MIT, I think one has to look at, at a major research university, a large portion of what we do is basic research, which is very important to advance the science, advance general technology. So there's a whole layer of research which is critical, um, which is not around commercialization at all. What happens out of that work, things start to bubble up. 
And as they bubble up, somebody says, wow, maybe this could be used somewhere. And that's, in the early stage, that's when you want to start with some preliminary contact with the market. Um, it doesn't need to be an exhaustive amount. It just needs to be a little bit initially. Mm -hmm. Do we have an idea of something? And then let's take the research in that direction. Um, we also do have tremendous contact with industry um, at MIT. A lot of, you know, funding for some of our research comes with industry. We have industry people coming in all the time. Um, a lot of our professors consult with companies. We encourage that because it gets them out into the real world so they see what's going on. So I think what we want, we like to describe this. You were talking about porosity in mm -hmm. your things having holes. So we want a very porous boundary between the university and the outside world. In fact, MIT, although we're in a city, you can walk in right off the street. You can walk in off the street and actually walk right up to my office. There's no security. But we philosophically like having great interactions so you sort of see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So personally, I don't believe there is basic research and applied research. There, there are only good research and bad research. <laughs> and you need to bet for the best research possible. And then you need a mindset. So for people to be prepared, there is a good opportunity to jump into the opportunity. And then again, I will repeat myself, to have a strategy, to have a structure. So if somebody wants actually to start a company, the institute, the university, will have the channels to help he or she to start a company. So best research and a proper structure that will help you to go to the next step. Because remember, many of these undergrad or grad students are in their 20s. They you are know, very unexperienced people. So it's very important to have a structure and a method. Um, I think that that's the key thing. And again, no pure, unapplied, but only good and bad research. And we need to support excellent research. So let's talk about teams for a while. Um, what's the composition and how do you build a killer team? <laughs> uh, do the main researchers have to be in that founding team? How do you play that game? Well, we, um, <clears throat> this is a very important topic for us. Um, we would go out of business if our researchers always went to our spin-offs. So very often, so always, the researchers are on the team that creates the technology and that incubates it at SRI, always. As I said before, we bring in an entrepreneur from the outside to lead the company. More and more these days, we're also bringing in other talent to be part of the company. So the reason for that, again, is that our researchers, and there are some exceptions, mm -hmm. but our, our researchers are, are often not the best to not only not lead a spin-off company, but even be in a spin-off company. They want to be researchers. Some don't, and actually some of them do go with the company. But a killer team, just to answer your question, um, starts with a killer CEO, which in the early stage has an easy definition. A killer CEO is somebody who can get venture capital. That's a killer <laughs> CEO, right? And then a killer team is top technical talent. And frankly, that's not a problem. If you have a great idea and a great CEO, the talent will come. So I think um, our model is, is slightly different. Firstly, um, you know, at MIT, we're not really looking for billion dollar opportunities. It's mm -hmm. great if those happen. We just care about things having impact. So for us, a successful startup could do $10 million in revenue. It could never raise venture capital. It might raise it from angel investors or from customers. Um, but I'd also say for, for university technology to leave the university, it's very unusual that it does it with, without somebody going into that team. Um, you know, in, if it's going to a large company, maybe there's some consulting. But in most of our startups, there's a... PhD student, could be a master's student, could be a postdoc student or a group of them that go with the company. Um, because they really have, it's not just about licensing patents, there's a lot of know-how on how to do this stuff. They have to go with our professors, in most cases stay. We've actually, of our 28 companies out of the center, in two cases the professors quit their job to go with the company. Um, however, 
Um, at a university, we allow our professors, as I've mentioned, to consult. They're allowed one day a week of outside consulting. So if they do a startup, they use that day a week. Instead of doing paid consulting for a large company, they'll spend one day a week with the company. But that's in addition um, to the students going out. And I'd say in terms of CEOs, um, certainly if it's a company that's going to raise a lot of venture capital, they'll bring in an outside CEO. Uh, we have some very entrepreneurial students who have gone off and actually become the initial CEOs of the companies. Mm -hmm. So I will not say how to build a killer team, but how to build a team that will not kill the company, <laughs> which is even more important. Um, I think the main mistake, and now I'm helping many, many startups, is that usually the teams are made by people that are all contributing to the same thing. For example, a bunch of scientists, a bunch of geeks, or people from a business school, they want to find good technology, but they don't know how to, to find it. And a marvelous thing about these ecosystems is that it gives you the opportunity to meet people from other backgrounds. So the, the most important thing to have a, a team that will not kill your company is to have a diverse team. When you have three guys, that all of them computer engineers or computer scientists, uh, I don't know, they could be the best computer scientists in the world. They also need a finance guy, a marketing guy, you know, a CEO. So just make a diverse team. That's, that's recipe number one. Okay. Um, another recurring question, uh, do's and don'ts for an IP licensing office. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the don'ts. So, you know, when people um, come to visit us at MIT, and we get a lot of visitors from universities from all over the world, and some of them sit in the office and they say, you know, we feel we need to make more money out of licensing. And that's a go. And I said, well, start, just stop right there because you will fail. Um, the goal of a licensing office, and, and we strongly believe this, MIT does, I know Stanford does, is to have impact in the world. We say impact, not income. If your primary goal is income, you will make bad decisions. So, yes, you need to bring enough money back because you've got to cover all the costs of the patents and the staff, but I think the dues for a licensing office are focus on getting deals done. Uh, you can always, MIT licensing office gets deals done. Uh, something needs to be done, it gets done in a timely way, the terms are reasonable, and um, that's what you want to do, is get the deals done, get them done in a timely way, and you know, not worry too much about how much money comes back to the university. I don't know how they run, but I would like to say one thing. Uh, when we were very small, one of the, the biggest strengths that we had is our patent was from MIT. Because two things. One is credibility, which is good. But if somebody was trying to infringe on our patent, we have MIT behind us. And that's very powerful. I'm saying this because here in Spain or other countries in, in Europe, when universities um, file a patent, how many of them will have the budget and the will to fight for that patent if somebody infringe on that one? Because those are very expensive uh, processes. So universities can be filing 5, 10, 20 patents a year. But that's the number we have here. Uh, and then if somebody is infringing on one of those, will the university be re uh, willing to spend 100,000, 200,000, half a million dollars to defend that patent. If not, that patent is worthless. So we, we need to start thinking about that. Let me make one other comment. Um, so the other comment, I think, if you're building a licensing office is, is hire old people. So, <laughs> you know, young people are great, but in my experience, um, what you really want in your licensing office is you want people who have been around in the world a lot, they should come out of industry. It's a great sort of second career for somebody who's going up on this career path. They decide they want to go along. So I think most of the people we hire at our licensing office will have at least 20 years experience from the outside because they're not trying to prove something. It's quite hard. I've been on the other side before I came to MIT negotiating with somebody who was two years out of a PhD 
had no idea how the real world worked, had no idea what was reasonable to get something done. So I think that's um, the key. Anything else? Um, I have other, another question that I've, I've, it's actually a discussion that I've had with several people in the audience. Uh, what's the role of big companies? If they want to spin out technology for, directly from the lab without a, a new company, uh, do you give them a different price, whether they have exclusive rights or non-exclusive rights over the IP? Well, there's, <coughs> there's several parts to that question. So, um, one, the, where, you, where you ended the question had to do with licensing technology to big companies. Okay, so I don't, that's usually, at least in our case, that's not to create a separate company, that's to somehow enhance the business of whatever company we're licensing to. And the answer is, of course, there's a big difference between an exclusive license and a non-exclusive license. We actually rarely do exclusive licenses of what we call background intellectual property. We always do exclusive licenses of foreground intellectual property. Foreground is the part that a company might pay for, background is what we came to the table with. But I think your question also has to do with the role of large companies in spin-off companies. And that's interesting because you've heard um, of different approaches here on the panel. And I said that at SRI, our focus, our, our sole focus is on venture capital based companies. And by and large, venture capitalists don't want to see large companies, which they would call a strategic partner, at the early stage of a company. And the reason is that the big company is too influential. The company will start doing what's good for the big company, not what's good for the market and for itself. Later on, they're thrilled to have strategic investors, but not in the early stage. Um. Yeah, so I think from the university side, it's, it's somewhat the same, somewhat different. Um, if you have something, if you're trying to develop a new drug, a new pharmaceutical, it's not going to happen in a startup. The, the scale of money <laughs> is, is enormous. And so, you know, if you look at, by the way, the, the R&D budgets, the five largest R&D budgets are all pharmaceutical companies, way higher. Roche is, I think, almost 10 billion a year. IBM is maybe two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically, if something of that scale is going to be, you know, they'll license it out of a university, they will develop it. Um, but what I've been seeing over the last several years is the large companies are much more interested in getting close to universities, seeing what's going on, becoming more engaged. What they realize is that most new technologies out of a university, with the exception of, say, a new drug, are going to happen in a startup. Large companies are not good at getting through that first phase. Um, it's much easier for them to stay involved and then acquire the company, but um, the smart big companies want to stay close to the startups. They may invest and then they may not. They don't care. If they invest, they want a minority position, they don't want a board seat. They may be a customer, but what they recognize is that the whole startup area is needed to help them with for enabling products, for things in the pipeline. So again, we have a lot of large companies that come to our events at the center that stay close to it. Um, we talk to them all the time when we want to understand the needs, want to understand the market. So a very important um, part of our ecosystem. But the, the one thing I would say which is a little bit different is that I do believe that big companies need to be more entrepreneurial because there are many opportunities for big companies to create their own not only just technologies, but also in services, um, how they approach the customers. There's a lot of innovation that could happen within big companies and it's not happening because the incentives are not aligned with that kind of vision. Uh, it sounds good and makes sense, but it's really, really difficult. So the kind of commitment from the leadership of those companies to change the culture in large corporations, it's really, it's really high. I mean, it needs to be huge to, to change the culture of big companies. But those are the ones that are going to be leading this century, the big companies that are entrepreneurial. One last topic. Um, we've seen over the last years that uh, venture capital money has dried up for some certain industries, like clean yes. tech we were discussing yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so pulling out 
really heavy investment technologies is becoming very tough. At the same time, there are new platforms that allow us to prototype new technologies that used to be very difficult for much less money in, lo in much um, shorter periods of time. And I remember a couple years ago seeing Elon Musk going to the International Space Station and being the first private uh, entrepreneur to dock a private spaceship on the, uh, on the space station. So what do you think the lo future looks like combining these two trends? Well, I think there's, there's no question that the venture capital industry is changing dramatically um, in all areas. You meant, so there, there have always been um, periodic um, areas of favor for the venture capital community and, and areas of non-favor. So it's certainly true that clean tech went through a period of favor and now is in a period of disfavor. But I think on top of that is um, major changes in, in the entire venture capital industry because of some of the reasons that you gave. So in, in the software area, which is most familiar to me, it's far less expensive to bring even a product, but, but certainly a prototype, to the marketplace. It's, it's much faster, it's much less expensive, so a large venture capital investment isn't required. The venture capitalists know that, so they sit back, they don't invest in companies like that. They want angel investors to invest in that, and if they show some traction, then the venture capitalists will invest. So I think that's a trend, and as you were saying, it's not just in software, it's in other industries as well, where as the cost of creating the company goes down, the role of venture capital evolves. Any last comments? We're in the last minute. I would also say, certainly we used to say in the venture business, the tourists have left. It's, it's yeah. you know, the serious people remain. Um, certain industries, energy, materials, life science, it still takes a lot of money. Um, we are seeing, I'm seeing more money being raised, even in those areas, initially by angels. It used mm. to be people would raise three, four hundred thousand dollars from angels. Now they could raise two, three million from angels. The other piece for our companies is um, government grants. So from the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Science, are actually quite important for a lot of, because we're doing science-based innovation. So there's government money, Defense Department money for some of those startups, which also makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Again, what I would say is that all that is true for developed economies, but for emerging economies, the role of government is very important. They are very different, for example. China, of course, with the five-year plant, making a, a huge change in the clean tech industry, for example. China is the first producer of solar panels, for example. Um, and I'm saying this because I believe for us, for the developed world, we need to start creating more public-private partnerships to take um, emerging technologies into new industries. That's the only way we are going to get manufacturing back to developed countries. Well, we could be discussing for the rest of the day because this is my favorite subject, but I, I really thank you very much for uh, coming here today, and uh, we're going to move on to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.